Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for welcoming me here in um, in Lincoln. Um, I'm delighted to be here and everybody has been so kind and it's been very well organized and I was quite surprised yesterday when I came down to the lobby at the hotel and there were like almost 50 students wearing jackets that said Nebraska Gothenburg and a bus outside <laughs> saying Gothenburg Sweden <laughs> and I'm from Gothenburg so I felt quite special actually. <laughs> it was a really nice coincidence. Today I'm going to talk about the relation between digital culture and ancient medieval rhetoric. And as a result, try to regard rhetoric as an interface, that is, an ambivalent, persuasive space that could provoke interpretation, behaviors, actions, and that involve humanistic theory. But first, let me begin in the early 1900s when in an inventory of Sweden's medieval churches began. During the Middle Ages in Sweden, almost 2,500 churches were built. Today, around 1,400 of them exist. But around 1900, they tried through images, texts, and drawings, every building, its history, its inventories, were to be analyzed and commented upon in a series of publications. And now 100 years later, it has not yet fi been finished. It's not completed. And Jonny Rusval, who was a professor of art history at the time, he wrote about their mission that the combination of sport and science make us true Athenians. And when they were exploring the churches with pen and papers, cameras, and folding rules, they called themselves the Ecclesia Militans. Let's see if I can. Yeah. These are images taken at that time. Around 1910, they visited Lagga Church. It's located in the region of Uppland, north of Stockholm. It was built in the early 14th century. The limestone paintings that depict the life of, of the Virgin Mary, it's a church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, <coughs> have never been painted over, which is quite unusual in Sweden. And those were taken at that time. And thrown away in the bell tower, they found a Madonna, an altarpiece. The researchers took her down with some help from the school children in the small village. She was in a very bad shape, as you can see. All of the, the color, the polychrome was gone, except for a tiny, tiny trace of green on the back of the screen. And one important detail was missing also. The Christ child was no longer in her embrace. Parts and pieces of him were found scattered around Mary in the bell tower, but the front part of Christ's face were not to be found anywhere. This Madonna, probably made in Sweden in the late 15th century, was now registered, described, photographed, and sent to the Nordic Museum in Stockholm to be restored. And this story is quite typical, and it forms an important part for understanding how and in what way the Virgin Mary, in a Swedish Protestant context, and this is important to, to think of, has transformed from being a cult object to become an art object. But during the Swedish Reformation, these Catholic objects were either burned or put away in attics, barns, or bell towers. Some objects were even put outdoors during long periods of time. So the inventory of the Swedish medieval churches was urgent, of course. Several of the Madonnas that were collected in the early 1900s have now been brought back to the churches. However, having and using the Virgin Mary in um, a church space, in a Protestant church space, is still quite provocative, could be quite provocative in Sweden. <laughs> Further, in our churches, in our museums, and in our online archives and collections, an important part of their history, of Swedish medieval history more generally, and of the medieval church space is lost. And as you know, during the Middle Ages, um, Items such as the, as the Madonnas, they were used, of course, in cult and liturgy, even in everyday life. And it's been documented in, sh in a Swedish context that the, the Christ child was often taken from Mary's embrace and carried to a woman giving birth, for example. Uh, but when these objects are presented as art only, sometimes displayed in clinical and transparent glass cages such as these, they lose, of course, their wider sensorial dimension, the textured surfaces, that are flattened by the el even electric lights create an untouchable and immobile image. And these are the online archive that exists today of uh, medieval material culture in Sweden. And these interfaces reproduce a post-romantic notion 
of aesthetics. Um, an aesthetics identified then with a philosophy of idealized taste, with abstracted and generalized idea of the beautiful, and not with the meaning it had until the late 18th century, pertaining to things perceptible by the senses, having to do with embodied experience, perception and feeling. They also, as you see, remediate print technology, print culture, perhaps rather the printed book page, the squareness. And the images have the status of objective replicas. They emphasize the fixed single appearance as the object's prevailing uniqueness. And to quote uh, Martin Foyce in his book, Virtually Anglo-Saxon, in modern representation, the power of print culture joins with that of perspective to re-render medieval objects as singular, static, and unified. And naturally, we cannot expect to carry around a Madonna from the early 14th century. But in this type of remediation, crucial aspects of not only the object's material and aesthetic use during medieval times are misrepresented. Objects that were meant to be used in cult and liturgy are presented as art objects, reimagined in a singular snapshot of a, what we could call an original condition, limiting our view of medieval representation. And one problem is that the interfaces that are used to present these objects, they don't emerge from the material or of an interface design that integrates humanistic principles in their organization. Medieval objects were offered to the senses, their rich surfaces teasing the desire to touch, to smell, to taste, and to experience them in space. And matter then was the locus of change, organic, fertile, and in some sense alive, to paraphrase medieval scholar Caroline Walker Bynum. Would it be possible to create an interface that captured this manifestation of changing surfaces under shifting conditions? Would it be possible to focus on the interaction between the object and subject, between Madonna and viewer? Would it be possible to unfold a Madonna's performance in space? <coughs> As a part of um, uh, the cross-disciplinary project, uh, Imitatio Maria, I've taken approximately five or 6,000 photographs and video recordings from nearly 100 Swedish churches. And in order to put the images of, for example, the Madonna sculptures in the context of the multi-sensuous and performative church space, we have created prototypes for a site-specific digital installation where we have used high-resolution screens, sensors, directional sound and light in an effort to create an interface that is structured by categories that emerge from medieval rhetoric and its emphasis on performance, persuasion and space. Um, I don't have um, any films of these installations, so I will have to describe them, but I will do that very briefly. Lots of work have been done about the ocularity of the later Middle Ages. Um, in our prototypes, movement, touch, and sound, and dynamic light settings are considered crucial parts of seeing and relating to these objects. The installations have been used then as a potential to strengthen sensation in an effort to not privilege vision over other senses. And these interactive installations, they consist of 11 detached, big, high-resolution screens. Some of them are multi-touch. We have used then various forms of sensors and cameras, a sound system, as well as a flexible light, flexible light ceiling that can create special effects, shapes, and images on the lighting plane, as well as to project different colors. And these, those screens are part of the, the Humlab space, the studio space in Humlab. So they are placed around the walls in one of our studios. And in this installation, the viewer can cho choose different paths, led on then di by directed sound, light, and images. Uh, and the installations respond to the embodied participations of these viewers in real time. And as I mentioned earlier, the installations, uh, the conceptual and theoretical installations uh, <coughs> framework of the installation are based on ancient and medieval rhetoric, especially the concepts memoria, the rhetorical faculty of memory, and here not just meaning recalling, as we usually think of the term, but in the broad classical and medieval cognitive sense of thinking and categorizing. And ductus, flow, movement, direction, or journey, or way, and it's in its performative sense having to do with different kinds of obstacles along the way. And then the ancient rhetorical practice of ekphrasis, 
As it's defined then by the assumption of a live audience, it emphasizes immediacy and the impact on the listener. So when an orator spoke about a place, a monument, or an event, unseen or unfamiliar to the audience, he was to, supposed to use details to create a visual image in the eyes of the mind of the listeners. So these are the main rhetorical concepts that the installations are based upon. And installations such as these have evolved from and in relation to architecture, of course, sculpture and performance. Naturally, this is not an entirely novel practice. I mean, in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, and of course, in medieval monastic rhetoric, the concept of architecture was used as a crucial metaphor for reading and experiencing artworks. For example, the 12th century Benedictine monk Peter of Sell, he writes about how the reader should think of Genesis as a kind of map and journey through the greater part of the reading of Genesis. And I quote him, enter the ark at the time of the flood and with a de deliberate but light step go through the contents of this book. And he writes further, and I just have to quote him some more because I think this is such a wonderful quote, uh, a wonderful way of thinking about the codex as a multi-sensuous and not as a, an artifact or object, but the codex, the book, that's something that does and executes. And he writes further, whenever you enter a pleasant meadow of prophetic blessings, loosen the folds of your garment, stretch your belly, open your mouth and extend your hand. Then come to Exodus, grieving for the entry into Egypt, then admire the foreshadowing of our redemption in the blood of the sacrificial lamb. Observe how the law was given on Mount Sinai and how it is open to spiritual understanding. By progression of virtues, run through the 42 stopping places in the Sinai with what they signify. And then with an angelic mind, construct within yourself the tabernacle and its ceremonies. So he emphasizes variations of tempo and mood, the colors of the journey determined in each site, when he encourages the reader to walk, enter, travel, as well as to look, touch, taste, and hear the text. The concept that an artistic work is a journey were certainly then to be found in ancient rhetoric, and it achieves a particular importance during the Middle Ages, and one is said to travel through a composition, whether words or materials. And Ductus um, is about finding one's way through a composition by arranging it as a journey, through linked places where each such space or locky has its own mode or color. So it's about performance and process journeying through a work of art, a church space, analyzing this experience as an ongoing process rather than examining a static or completed object from a distance. And the movement among this, in this composition or in the church space is never the same, it can and should vary, depending on what kind of obstacles you have chosen for your, your reader, your audience whether you want them to work a bit, to look beneath or through your words, images to another agenda you might have. So the medieval church spaces with several altars, no benches or windows as of today, the wall paintings, paintings in the ceilings, stained glass windows, screens, text, music, collaborated in a multifaceted purpose to guide those moving through these spaces, laity and clergy, in a set of possible journeys. It's situations, events, spaces that have to be worked through. So a medieval church or a Madonna sculpture can't be fully experienced at a distance and as an object only. So the interactive installations that we have created take Ductus as a condition for navigating the Swedish medieval church space, whereas viewers in front of a screen watching or using a 3D model or browsing through an archive of images are usually expected to disregard actual space and time in a way. You try to focus and try to be Im Im find immersion, uh, be immersed, what, immersed by what is happening on the screen. Our installations try to push um, their viewers to be constantly aware of the material exhibition space. The viewer's experience with these installations foregrounds not only space between the viewer and the screen, but also the space between the screens 
and of the technological media object itself. So the screen then shifts from centering the viewer to being a point of emphasis to a viewer that moves around from screen to screen, guided by images, sound, and light, but constantly aware of the physical space. So for us, it was crucial not to create, try to create immersion or illusion, uh, but rather to try to emphasize the importance of space. And we tried not to make too fancy <laughs> uh, visualizations either. We wanted to, 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 to keep the, the spaces in between. Uh, because the spaces in between the screens put focus on acts of producing instead of the finished product. These spaces between the screens help us call attention to the constructedness of knowledge, of ambiguity, uncertainty, and lack of singularity or fixity, and especially when it comes to the, the, the fragmentary evidence that we have from Swedish medieval liturgy, for example. We don't, almost don't, we have, don't have any material at all, almost. So in a way, it functions, or it aims to function, as Johanna Drucker defines the concept of interface in her latest book. And I quote her, aesthetic dimensions and imaginative vision make interface a space of being and dwelling, not a realm of control panels and instruments only existing to be put at the service of something else. And she continues that the real challenge is, challenge is in conceptualizing the spaces of interfaces that engage humanistic theory. So behind the work that we have done here lies a combination of making and conceptualizing. The theoretical and rhetorical starting points when we started working with the prototypes, finding concepts that could be represented through the material prototypes. So we then used the prototypes, the installations for reconfiguration, conversation, reflection, exploring different possibilities, thinking about how the prototypes could critique and extend relevant concepts and models. We have tried here then not only to bridge the gap between physical material and conceptual exploration, but also to think critically about knowledge production within the humanities. And one question that came up quite early was whether it would be possible to extend and implement the logic of the site-specific installations into an online archive. Would it be possible to archive also the installations? Uh, so, we created a prototype for an archive. I'm um, not sure. Would it be possible to put push play there? It doesn't work. You can look at it outside. <laughs> it, it works outside. <laughs> the idea behind this, um, this archive is that uh, it will be possible to experience the installations. You shall not have to go to Umeå, even it's quite nice in Umeå, but you should be able to explore them here <coughs> in this room, which is a 3D model of the Humlabs, one of the Humlab studio spaces. So here they will be uh, developed. We um, uh, would run either simulations or um, it will be possible to, to to experience the installations in real time. But the idea behind this archive is uh, we wanted to show the material, or here you don't see it, but the code behind the installations. So what you see here behind the transparent walls is all the images, the 6,000 images that make up the archive. So we wanted to create an, an, um, a surface that made it possible to see all the decisions that we have made, the basis for the archive, not just the finished end product. So what you will also be able to do, but you can't see it in this film, is that you will be able to move out in the open space and confront and experience all the images. And we have deliberately not tagged them with traditional uh, metadata. We have used instead Mary's emotions, so they're tagged by her emotions. You will be able to search on uh, her, her sorrows, for example, and so we'll be able to follow Mary's hand on Jesus' dead body juxtaposed in several different churches throughout several different landscapes. So that's one part of it. Another part of this archive is that it will also be possible when you find a Madonna in the space outside or search for a Madonna, you will also see, be able to follow her way uh, from when she was first found <laughs> in Laga church and all the documentation around her. Uh, so it will be uh, 
See if I can go back. And I can't go back. Go back two slides. Another one. No, we've come too far now. Anyway, okay, this is, <laughs> this is not what I was supposed to show, but we, we got lost in the presentation. Anyway, you, you will be able to see the documentation that lies behind. This is like very far in the presentation, so you have to go back quite far. The, the slide before this slide, please. Next. Next one. Perhaps I can do it myself now. Ah. It doesn't want to stop on that particular slide. There, there it is. So. <laughs> uh, so we want the archive to be a digital interface that functions as a critical framework generator of knowledge. So we have tried to choose a difficult ductus for the audience of the archive. And we will connect the images then, as you see here, to all the different layerings that, ha that have created the Madonna we see today. We want our decisions to, to show. Uh, it will comprise and it in itself then be a critical visualization of Mary's journey from cult object to art object. And one way of thinking about medieval material culture is not always by an examination of the actual object, but through a study of printed, photographed, sketched, painted, or digital reconstructions of it, and such a remediation of the physical by the representational could give us a multifaceted summary of how we subsume medieval space and materiality under both later technologies of representations and modern notions of how space functions. It could also invite us to revise our modern order of medieval space and to posit modes in which we may reclaim aspects of those space sets, such spaces that have become largely lost in translation between different medial expressions and technologies. And again, I would like to mention Johanna Drucker's latest book, Visual Forms of Knowledge Production, that was published last year. She argues for the need and importance of digital interfaces that incorporate humanistic principle in their organization. And she calls for humanistic computer languages, interpretative interfaces, and information systems that can tolerate inconsistency among types of knowledge representation, classification, fluid ontologies, and navigation. And one way, according to Drucker, is to let the interface express the content model that comes from critical study, editing, bibliography, or other traditions rooted in the appreciation and engagement of material or cultural materials. Another way would be to use a pre-modern, pre-print interface, such as rhetoric, to be the guiding principle. Rhetoric could be defined as the specificity of production when it comes to medieval material culture, a foundation on which meaning is configured. In rhetorical analysis, an artifact has direct agency as it offers means of persuasion. And rhetoric is, as you know, essentially about making an argument. So following the ductus of a medieval church sp space, via different paths, images, and objects could be rhetorically understood, of course. Its goal is conversion and belief. Finally, before I I end, I would like to return and finish the story about this Madonna on a more happy note. Um, due to very lucky and unexpected circumstances, and perhaps with the aid of the school children who had carried Mar Mary down from the bell tower, the junior school teacher, Mrs. Skug, Mrs. Forrest in English, recalled that she had for many years in a drawer in the classroom, seen something that perhaps could be relevant. And there it was, Christ's ha head had been found, his frontal face had been lying in her drawer in the classroom. So after 400 years, he was, I don't think he had been there, there that long, but he was uh, reunited with Mary. And this is what she looks like today, after being brought back to Laga Church, where she resides, um, in a proper, where, where the Mary altars always were, on the northeast wall. Thank you. This actually does not project out here. It's for the live streaming, so <laughs> you won't hear this. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Cecilia. Um, and so now we have some time for some questions. 
I'll project louder. Um, does anyone have any questions <coughs> for Cecilia? I will start off. <laughs> um, so have you had an opportunity, I know you've been working on this and building these installations, have you had an opportunity to step back and approach your own research using mm -hmm. these, the, using the um, installation and the interfaces mm -hmm. that you've been working with? Mm -hmm. And if so, how, what sort of, um, how, what kind of um, insights is this offering in, that's mm -hmm. been different than perhaps a more traditional approach? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a cross-disciplinary project, so it's, I'm from comparative literature, we have one art historian and one professor of history and one professor of Scandinavian languages, and they have used um, these installations, and we have tried to juxtapose the image and text and so on, and it has definitely put, I mean, into perspective, I mean, using, not using only print, but trying to think about objects such as, um, you know, rhetorical concepts and think about them via the, the digital lens or using the interface as a lens on pre-modern rhetoric or pre-modern concepts has in a way loosened them up or has deconstructed the way that print technology has cemented these uh, terminology in a way. Uh, so, for example, Ekphrasis, who is uh, reading Ekphrasis through the digital interface, could, you know, make us see it in a different way that is more attuned to the way that it was used during, you know, ancient practice, because rhetoric, the, the concept of Ekphrasis has been cemented in a way by print technology for the past, you know, 500 years or so. So, that's one. I'll just follow up with mm -hmm. one other thing. In terms of um, uh, the idea of bringing in sort of this multi-sensual <coughs> experience with, with sound, mm -hmm. have, has any of the, of the researchers using this environment, have they looked at sort of going through the spaces from a visual aspect without mm -hmm. the sound and then mm -hmm. with the sound? And have no. They, I was thought no. that perhaps that would be an interesting sort of experience mm -hmm. and look at the comparison. It's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious about the long-term preservation issues associated with the installation. Can mm. you talk about that? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, of course, a, a big problem, <laughs> uh, and they won't be, you know, in you won't be able to experience the, the installations in Umeå uh, any, anymore. So it will be the the online archive as it is that would be like what is preserved, uh, and for how long we well, we don't know. <laughs> yes. So. So you've clearly put a lot of thought into the design of your interface, um, and a lot of people working in interface design will emphasize interfaces that are meant to be transparent, mm -hmm. um, and I think yours is intentionally not transparent, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, it's part of, of this, we try to make this a, a critical visualization that always makes the, make the, the audience or the user aware of that this is a reconstruction or a construction. That's why we didn't choose to create, uh, for example, a, an end product that is where we, where we try to create immersion or, for, for example, trying to reconstruct what it was really like in the medieval church space, but always, try, always trying to keep you know, the, the critical distance and the awareness of, 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 of it being a reconstruction, so. Mm -hmm.